You glad to be here today? I, what? Are you glad to be here today? I hope so, because God has an important word for us today. In Matthew chapter 5, if you will open a Bible to there, Matthew chapter 5, and, uh, and look at those verses uh, that are at the beginning here of the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, beginning verse 13, go through verse 16, Matthew 5, talking about the difference that we make in this world. You know, there are people that are wondering... And I really make a difference in my little, my little area of uh, life where God has planted me. And what Jesus would say to us is absolutely. If you'll think about it, the people who had gathered there at the, uh, at, the, at the Sermon on the Mount, a multitude of people, there are people just like us, people from all walk of life. There are people there that are actually thinking, God can't use me. But Jesus will say, when you come to him, when you're part of his kingdom, believe me, God can use you in amazing ways regardless of who you are. In fact, he wants to use you in amazing and powerful ways. In fact, what he says here is we're similar to some things. He takes two of the common elements of the day and he uses them to say that we're in similar to these two powerful elements. We are, we're, we're like salt, we're like light that we're just singing about. So what salt is to food uh, is, and what darkness, I mean, what light is to darkness is what, what we are in this world in which God has placed us and has planted us. And, and listen, we need to listen to this because not only does he shape and change our lives, but he wants to use us in powerful ways. And there's one thing that we have to keep in mind throughout this, throughout this message and throughout this day and the days ahead is that we have a responsibility to be salt and light. We have a responsibility. And uh, he, didn't say, he didn't say be like it. We are it. We are salt and light in this world, uh, a greater emphasis. So if, you, if you're filling in those blanks on your listening guide, here's the one thing that I want you to write in, that as citizens of Christ's kingdom, he is establishing his kingdom, see? That's why he's come. And as citizens of his kingdom, we are change agents in this social context in which he has placed us. We're change agents because of what he's doing in our lives. And our assignment as his disciples is to act in the way, a powerful influence like what salt is, what light is. And so when we, when we begin verse 13, what he what he does, he writes it in, or it's written, or spoken in, what's called emphatic language. In other words, there's an overemphasis of what is being said. So Jesus says to his disciples and to the multitudes that are listening, we're listening today, and he says, you, you, you yourselves, you are. So it's an overemphasis. You, you yourselves are what? You are salt, like salt, influence of salt. In, on food, that's what you are in this life. You are like the influence of light in darkness. That's what you are in this world. So it's an over You are like that kind of influence in this world. And so how in the world does that happen? How in the world do we become, how do we become uh, an influencer like salt and like light? Well, let me tell you what happens. When you come to Jesus, when you come to Jesus and you repent and you ask him to come into your life and he fills you with Holy Spirit power, what he does is he flavors your life. Oh, yeah, you are flavored. I'm telling you, it's better than butter on popcorn. It, it is better than any kind of flavoring you can. He flavors your life. We are flavored with Jesus. And then, not only that, but he ignites, ignites our soul. I mean, he gets a hold of us. It's like being plugged into the electricity, and the light comes on. I'm telling you, and that's what he does in our life. Amen? So Jesus is is letting us know that we have a very important assignment as, as his disciples in this world. Very important. So number one, write this in, we are like godly seasoning in a tasteless world. That's verse 13. We're like godly seasoning in a tasteless world. You, you yourselves, you are the salt of this earth. You're the salt all around. You're an influential power. In fact, when they heard that in that day, they knew that Jesus was saying <laughs> that you are highly valuable in the eyes of God. 
just like you would have been in that day. Salt was so valuable in that day. In fact, one of the things Margie said here is that, mo- uh, that salt was equal to money. In fact, there were times when, when workers or soldiers may have been paid in salt. Uh, and so uh, that's not like a ripoff, doesn't it? But it's not. It was paid in salt, equal to money. And so if you came, you know, if you were, if you were a good worker, let's say, somebody might say of that person, man, that, that person is worth his salt. He worked hard. He's worth his salt. And then if somebody was really good, they were useful, they were genuine, I might say of that person, she is the salt of the earth. So we use that as a description of how important someone is. When Jesus says that of us, you are, you are uh, the salt of the, of the earth, what he is saying is, is that you're highly important. But how? You're highly important as an influential power in this world for the kingdom of God. We are placed here being touched by, the, by God's life in us in order to influence others around us, and we can do that because salt is a change agent. Whatever salt comes into context with, it changes that. Whatever we, we, we put it on, it changes, a change agent. We are a change agent. I had no idea there were 14,000 different applications of salt, qualities of salt. I'm only going to give you three. Praise the Lord. I hear people saying, man, we'll be all day. But I had no idea. But we understand how important and valuable it is. In all of those applications, 14,000 applications of salt, what it's saying is how valuable we are, how God can use each and every one of us in a powerful way. Let me just tell you one. One is used like a, like, like a quality is a, a healing agent. Salt is used, was used as a healing agent in that in that day. So, you know, you heard of that's like salt in a wound. Was, you know, it's, it, it would have, it would, you'd know it was working pretty quick, right? And, and so in that day, you know, they wore sandals, had a lot of foot wounds, and so they would soak their feet in salt water as a healing agent, so as a purifying agent. You know, we had a, we, we would, uh, we had a little cow that we would raise to, oh, become sweet beef, you know what I'm saying, uh, to be a, uh, it was great. We, we called them Moo Moo 1, Moo Moo 2, Moo Moo 3. And uh, one of them got pink eye. You know, I had the pupils stuck out there, you know. And uh, this guy said, well, I guess we're just going to slaughter. Get rid of it. And no, my dad said, give it to me. Took it to the house, put the purple stuff on there, and then put salt in it every day. Now, I know that we have a veterinarian here, and I'm, he's thinking, mercy, we could have treated that. But what we did was, after a while, that salt... That salt cured that, so he saw it coming uh, when the day came, but he saw it, he was healing. So there's a healing quality to salt. Then, then there, what you think of it is, man, it, it creates a thirst. You know, when you, when you eat something with a lot of salt in it, it creates a thirst. And so, uh, you know, it, it, we, we're like that kind of a, a agent here. It's kind of like when Jesus met with the woman at the well, remember? And, uh, of course, it was, she was thirsty. That's why she was there. Jesus said, talked to her about spiritual matters, and then said, woman, what you need is to drink of living water. When you drink that water, you'll never be thirsty again. She said, sir, give me that water. Give me that water. So when we're creating a thirst, it is a thirst for the things of Jesus. And then it's a preserving agent. A preserving agent. So meats and foods would be packed in salt, so that it would keep it from decaying or keep it from spoiling over a period of time. They didn't have refrigerators like we do. You know, I mean, we've created our own experiments in refrigerators. But they would put it, pack it in salt, and it would preserve it over a period of, of time. Preserving agent. Now, I want to tell you, when we hear this, we talk about our responsibilities as salt, how we're similar influences, and there's so many others. Uh, ways that we are influencers. What Jesus is saying is this. Without us, there are going to be unhealed wounds. Unhealed wounds that Jesus can heal. Because we can, we can be that, that, that shaping, changing agent in our world. But without us, in our context, listen, you're going to be in your context with your little nook of the world, with your family, with your context of friends and others I will never get to. And you are salt for them. And as a salt, as a salt in saltiness of Jesus, and what you're going to end up doing is you 
to bring healing to wounds, wounds of the soul, wounds of the life, wounds in relationship, whatever it may be, as we, as we flavor that situation in Jesus. And then, and then without him, we, there, there'll be a, a lack of, of, of a satisfying a thirst for God. Man, we, we, we're out there to, to, to help create a thirst for Jesus. And then with, without us in the world, the world would literally become a rotting, stinking mess. It'd be worse than, than a teenager's shoe, shoes in the summertime. I'm saying it's going to be a rotting, stinking <laughs> mess. You know what I'm talking about. So, in fact, where what, G, what Jesus seems to be saying, what we recognize, where there is no salt, where we're, where we're missing, where the disciples are missing, it leads to absolute destruction. Where they are, where, where Jesus' disciples are being persecuted or driven out, it leads to complete rot in that area of the world. It will lead to complete rot in that family without the witness of Jesus. We are indispensable in this life. We are indispensable and necess necessary in this life. You are important. I am important. We're important to those around us. Now, I don't know how, how often do you use salt in a day? One time? Two? How many times do we use salt? Well, now I found out we got 14,000 different applications. We're using it right now. Didn't even know it. <laughs> but but here's, the, here's the thing. Here's what Jesus is communicating to us. He's taking salt. And every time we take salt and we open it up, a little packet, you know, that water, water burger packet or whatever, and we put it all over our French fries, amen, mm, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, never talk about food an hour like this. There will be a mass exit. But man, when you put, I, you know, put salt on that, whenever you put salt on something, you know what you're being reminded of? You're reminded of a mission. Every time we take salt and we use it, Jesus says, you are the salt you're, you, you yourselves, and no one else. You are the salt of the earth. You're the difference maker. You're the influence in this world. Every time we use salt, put salt on something, it's a reminder we're on a saving mission with Jesus in this world. And, we're, and, and I'm going to tell you something. I'm a salt man myself. I love salt. I know it. I, I, we've gone through all the different dangers of salt, whether it was good or bad or whatever. I'm just taking the risk, but I'm going to lay salt on everything. But and here's the thing. If I'm eating eggs, I'm going to put some salt on there. Amen? I know I've got some. And then if I eat a tomato, I'm going to put some salt on there. If I'm eating watermelon, I'm going to put some salt on there. I know we're going too far now. But I'm just saying we'll salt everything. I'm a salt man. And when we say that, whenever we use salt, what we're doing is when he says we're the salt of the Lord, you know what we're doing? We're adding Jesus to everything. We are the salt of this, of this earth. We're the salt in our context. We are adding Jesus to everything. We got that little salt dispenser. We're sprinkling Jesus everywhere. We're putting the flavor of Jesus on all things. We're wanting Jesus to be tasted in this world. Amen. Amen. Don't make me go get the tambourine. I'm just telling you now. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going to add Jesus. But what if? Now listen, this is where the responsibility comes in. What if? What if? What if you lose your saltiness? How will people taste Godliness. If you're the one to influence their life like salt influences food, like salt brings healing to a wound, if you're to be that difference and you have lost your saltiness, then what good is it? And what Jesus is doing is addressing the absurd. It is absurd to think that salt can lose its saltiness, but here's the thing. Jesus seems to be communicating that God's people can... can can uh, lessen their influence, can choose not to be as powerful an influence, can, can hold back the saltiness in a sense, if you will. And Jesus will say in this verse 13, what good is it? It's only good to be thrown underfoot, trampled under horse or man, see, in the pathway. So, you know, it's, it's very difficult to to often tell the difference between finely grained sand and salt. The only difference is in the taste. And so in the marketplace, people would be selling salt, and a person would buy the salt, they'd get down the road to get to their home, wherever they would, and then they'd open it up, and they'd, begin, they'd realize, this is not salt at all, this is sand. And they'd take it outside in absolute frustration, they'd throw it down in the, out onto the street, it's absolutely no good. So there's this calling upon us to be 
salt to be what we are in Christ. And so there's a calling upon us because often we can lose sight of our mission. And here's the thing. If we fail at our mission, then we're lost in the process. Not, you say, well, not just those people, not just those around us, but we are lost in the process. And I, that's the reason why I put in the listening guide the quote by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a seminary professor during the rise of Hitler in Germany. He was a German theologian and professor. Hitler was coming along in the Nazi agenda, and people were basically turning to that and away from the call of Christ. And eventually, Bonhoeffer was arrested, and he was placed in prison. Eventually, he would be executed, give his life. But in that time, he wrote what has become one of the best-known, well-known books on discipleship. It basically is a book detailing the Sermon on the Mount. Most of it's to that. And, and uh, it's called The Cost of Discipleship. I, I challenge you to, to either download it in audio form or to get a copy of it and read it. But this is what he said. You look at that quote in your bulletin. He says that the call of Jesus Christ means either that we are salt of the earth or else we are annihilated. Either we follow the call or we are crushed beneath it. There is no question of a second chance. What he means by that is this is our time. This is our opportunity to be influenced. We know that there are those things that come at us and against us. There are those things that water us down and we're not as powerful as Christ means for us to do. This scripture is told to us so that we might get salty in the Lord. We need the saltiness of Jesus today uh, because there, this is our opportunity. Y'all understand what we're saying? Amen? Amen? You understand the importance and the significance? Amen? Amen? You're getting it. I'm getting it. We are it. We are salt. Let's make an influence. Not only are we similar to salt, but we are also similar to light. So write this down. We are God's solution for a world in the dark. You, you yourselves, you are the light of the world. And then he goes on to say that a, a town built on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl or under a basket. Instead, they put it on the stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, your light shines before others that let your light shine before others that they may see your good works or good deeds and glorify your father in heaven you you yourselves we are the light in this world and I'm gonna tell you something light is wonderful light is absolutely wonderful amen now we're talking about at night right I mean we, we, we could turn the lights off and we got some daylight filtering in we'd be all right but I'm telling you what light is wonderful especially at night. I like it at night. It is significant. You know, when I was, uh, you know, I don't know, 13, 13, 14 years old, I got my single shot shotgun and, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, got my uh, little, kind of like a little miner's light, you know, I'm talking about spotlight, put it on my head and got my red bone hound dog and going to go do a little raccoon hunting, you know, and just kind of ventured off the backyard about a, about a half a mile deep out into the woods and that red bone caught scent of something and rrr, 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 took off. I know the kids woke up. Now I'm just saying it took off, you know, I said, rrr, rrr, rrr. And, then, and then I got my little spotlight and I've got the hammer cocked down on my, on my little single shot, 20 gauge shotgun and I'm out there in the middle of nowhere and that dog sound disappeared up and over the hill. Rrr, 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 rrr. Gone. And I'm sitting there, I'm just waiting and the light went out. My spotlight went out, went out. I, I put the, cock the hammer back, you know, put the hammer back on the gun. I, I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm, I'm like doing this. And it is pitch dark. There is no moonlight. It's a little cloudy. There's no starlight out. It is pitch dark. You can't see your hand in front of it. And then I start hearing something coming in the darkness right at me. 
And I'm telling you, when it is pitch dark, you can't see your hand in front of your face, and it is dark out in the middle of the wilderness, you start thinking about that movie Grizzly, and you start thinking about things that are coming at you. I thought sharks were coming at me. I thought I could hear Jaws music. It was happening. And then I'm doing this. Ah, 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 ah. Hey, now I know where I am. Listen, I'm telling you. And then, I, and then it's getting closer, closer, closer. I'm hitting everything I can to get the wires. I don't know what it needed to do. And then the light came on, and there were these red eyeballs right in front of me. It was the dog. He'd come back for me. He's like, what are you doing over here in the dark? I tell you, never did I want the light to come on as I did right there. And I like the light at night. Now listen, Jesus says to us, each one of us, we're like little ha lighthouses, like little lighthouses out here in this world. Imagine, imagine covering up the light out here. You're the lighthouse. Sometimes for a child, for mom and daddy, you're the lighthouse as a youth for your home, maybe in your class, maybe among your friends. You're the lighthouse at your workplace. You're the lighthouse in, in your little neighborhood. You're the lighthouse of Jesus out here, and they need us. Light is wonderful in the darkness, and people are in the darkness, and we need to shed the light. And listen, in that little first century world, they'd have had, they'd have had a little uh, olive oil lamp. That's what they had. They'd put that little olive oil in there, and it would have put off like a three-eighths inch light. That's all. Three-eighths inch light. Just a little bit of light. And that little light, that little oil, olive oil lamp would have lit up the room. It's powerful. It expels the darkness. It, 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 it deludes the darkness. It is powerful over the darkness. And I, I tell you that I was the first one in my family to become a Christian as a teenager. And the first thing that the light of Jesus and the saltiness of Jesus began to do in my life is to bring me in prayer for my mother, my father, and my brother to ache before God on their behalf to say, please, O oh Lord, that they might be saved. That's, that's, the, that's the quality that's on at work in us. And when that light, that light comes into us, there are certain things that becomes obvious. If you're writing down what are the qualities of light, I'm going to give you two. One is light is obvious in a person's life. Light is obvious. It is not meant to be hidden. It is obvious. Jesus was teaching out in the daylight, right? But he could look all around on far distance. He'd look on the hillside and he'd see these these cities that people would have known, whether it was Gamal or Hippos or whatever it was, he could see them at some distance from where he's teaching. And he says that a light is like a city on the hill, especially at night, it cannot be hidden. Man, there's just light showing up. I mean, you know, from there, from those places. And Paul said, as children of God, we shine as lights in the darkness, in this darkness. So that's one thing, light is, obvious it's not to be hidden it's to be set out and and become obvious right and then here's the here, here's here's the other thing light draws people out of the darkness light draws people out of the darkness you know I you know I don't know how many times I've seen an old western I love how many y'all love westerns I just love westerns yeah. you know and I don't know how many westerns I've seen where somebody show up hey, I came up I saw you campfire you know, drawn in. Man, light is so powerful, and people are being drawn in out of the darkness. But, but here's the absurdity. Jesus addresses this absurd notion. Lights are not to be hidden. They're, they're to be, imagine somebody that lights their little oil lamp, lights a candle, only to cover it up. And everybody, everybody say, what are you talking about? You know, at night, so this is what I want you to do. Tonight, I want you to get home. I want you to turn all the lights off, turn electricity off. I want you to light a lamp right in the middle of where you're going to gather, and then I want you to cover it up. People say, that's stupid. That's dumb. Well, that's what everybody's doing. They say they're pulled in. Say, that's the craziest thing. Well, we're not to cover up that light. You know, I, I know it. It's, it's in me. You want to sing it too. You know, this little light of mine, I know it. We sang it all back. Y'all want to sing it? Yes. Yeah. This little light of mine. Y'all stand up. Come on, right now. Come on, stand up. Come on, wait, wait, wait. Hold up. Let's start over. 
No, stand up. <laughs> stand up. Now remember, you're the light. This little light is the light, right? This little light of mine. Come on now. I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine. Oh, yeah. I'm going to just think you're at a concert somewhere. This little light of mine. Light it up. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. What's that mean? Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. Two hands. Let it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No! I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. You did good. Thank you. Be seated. Praise the Lord. Now listen, that was a lot of fun. But here's the truth. Here's the truth. This is what we need to know, whether it's about salt or about light. You say, that's absurd. We'd never cut up, cover up the light. But you know we have, what, 30,000 people here? We have enough people in this room to ignite this city for Jesus. Amen? Amen. We just got to do it. We got to let the light shine. So Jesus says, what if? What if the call is denied? What if the choice is to cover up, either because we're afraid or because we are conforming to the lives of those around us? What will happen? You know what will happen? We'll leave this world in darkness, and then we put ourselves in darkness. So instead, shine. Shine for Jesus. Let's determine that we're going to take this light of Jesus today and we're going to set it on the lampstand. We're going to set it on the stand so that everyone in our household can see it. Let's just determine that we're going to let Jesus so fill up our lives so that when we're before others, they will see it. Because here's the purpose, that they may see your good works. In other words, we're going along just changed by Jesus and we're going along and we're acting and doing and behaving a certain way, people said, man, look at Jesus. Look at something different in that person's life. They see it through our daily life. You know what that do? When we're walking in the light of Jesus, it brings glory to our Father. And he says, I'm so happy. I'm happy. So how in the world we, we do that? We, how do we do that? One, listen, we have to love God. <coughs> love God, hunger and thirst for him. Live in a repentant purified, holy, crucified life, we got to love him with all our heart. And, uh, you know, I, I want to tell you this. Outside my backyard, I've got one of those solar lights, kind of a night light that I use. And, uh, and what I've noticed is that thing will shine at night. It will come on at night. And the only reason that it can shine at night in the midst of the darkness is because it's been in the sun all day long. I, I heard an amen. So that's, that's, that's it. And then when that's happening, we're able to treat others the way God wants us treated, and that shines his light. We show respect and humility and forgiveness and peacemaking. And on. You remember that storm we had a while back, woke us up early in the morning. I don't know what time it was, 3.30 in the morning, whatever time it was. And uh, and tornado it was around in the area, dancing around out here. And we had some pretty serious wind, and, then, and it knocked out the electricity. Y'all remember that? You remember that? Yeah, some of you, I heard you say, I didn't have any electricity for six hours, and I was, I was suffocating without any air conditioning. I mean, I heard it. We, 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 we remember. And, uh, and when, when, the, when the storm hit, and the electricity was off, and it's 3.30 in the morning, and you realize that there, the alarms are going off and there's a tornado in the area, you're going to be seeking shelter. And the first thing that you go for is what? Your cell phone. That's right. You go for the cell phone. That's right. Do you know that most cell phones, most phones are destroyed because they get dropped in the toilet? That's another aside. But uh, it's because they're using a light now. It's a flashlight. But, but the first thing you do, you're looking for light. You're looking for light. You know what's funny? I don't know how many times just out of habit I go over there and turn the light switch on. I don't know why it doesn't work. There's no electricity. You're looking for light. You're looking for a candle. You're looking for a, a, a flashlight. You're looking for a flashlight. Let me tell you this. We are light. We've been basking like the moon in the light of Jesus, and we reflect his glory. We reflect the glory of the living God. We reflect him through our life. 
And in the midst of this dark world, there are mighty storms that are going to come. And our light is shining in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of the storm. And there are people all around us are being drawn to the light of Jesus. They need us. They need that light of Jesus in the storm. Let me tell you something. You go out of this place, go out of the place knowing there's a great, great significance that's going to be worked out through your life. You're a difference maker. But let's go out of this place saying, God, I want to do everything possible to be the salt and light, to make a difference when all things come to an end.